Well, Joel, we have a really interesting show. So much has happened in the last couple of days. So we're trying just to catch up here at Uptime and, and give you the latest and greatest of wind energy news. Duke Energy is putting their renewable business up for sale. And there's talks of, of it being around $4 billion. And they have suitors already, which is amazing. So there's there's transactions happening in wind and then TPI composites and GE make a 10-year agreement in Iowa uh, for reopening a plant. Thank goodness. It's about time we see some blade plants opening in the U.S. So we are going to jump down to the Gulf Coast and talk about Texas and Louisiana, why we think that they're going to be offshore wind winners in the u.s uh, it's ready to go down there we just got to worry about some hurricanes and then i have an interview with windesco's senior director of customer success analytics jonathan kasuth and we go back and forth about all the technology that windesco is bringing from SCADA data enhanced SCADA data and all the little defects they can find in your wind turbine and how to to improve the efficiency and it's crazy how well, their software analytics are. They, they can really improve the performance of wind turbines. So we have a really busy show. Stay tuned. More to come. I'm Alan Hall, president of WeatherGuard Lightning Tech, and I'm here with my good friend from Wind Power Lab, Joel Saxon, Rosemary's on a well-deserved break, and this is the Uptime Wind Energy Podcast. Well, Joel, Duke Energy has decided to sell its renew renewable business, which is a complete shock. I didn't know anybody in the business community that was no heard anything about Thinking it. Just, that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Everybody figured Duke was in it for the long term, but they, the estimate for the business is about $4 billion. And it sounds like they have some tentative offers or aggressive bidders for, for that business. And it sounds like Duke is trying to uh, – bankroll themselves a little bit with this four billion dollars you could do a lot with four billion dollars uh, but they're trying to build up cash for taking on other projects so they're they're doing a lot of energy transitioning through um, in the next several years and they, they figured they better have some cash on hand especially if interest rates are higher and they're at the same time they're actually cutting cutting costs they're cutting about 300 million dollars in costs. Uh, so $4 billion in the bank if they can sell their renewables business, plus another couple hundred millions in savings. They're trying to, trying to protect themselves, and I think rightly so. But is this the first of, of this type of, of business sale where, where such a large asset of renewables hits the blocks? I, I don't know if it's the first. Uh, I mean, th th this size, man, definitely the biggest one we've ever seen right. come across. Yeah. Right? You see, you see a wind farm getting sold here and there, or a solar asset, or something like that. Like, it makes sense when, especially if you, you know, say you're, you know, if, if Allen Energy has two two wind farms next to my three wind farms, well, it may, might make sense for me to buy those. Then, then I can consolidate assets and O and M sure. people, and and you get cash, and I have a decent business model to operate because it's not adding a whole lot of overhead to my O and M costs. So, like that stuff happens, right? But four billion is that's big time, right? So they've got over three gigawatts of of power uh, generation facilities, and, they, and most of them in the U.S. Of course, uh, Duke is a uh, big energy company in the southeast is where they're based. At. I think South Carolina, North Carolina, right? North Carolina, yeah. And uh, I know they do have some assets in South America. I think they've got uh, – it's not a whole lot. Um, the, like I said, the majority of it is up here. But you saw – what two weeks ago we talked about Orsted doing a, a group sale of some assets, right? They called it – Right. Down, down farming or down what did they farming. call it? Right, yeah. yeah. Down farming, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so they, they did the same thing. And what it looks to me like is a cash grab. Now I guess – or not a cash grab but a cash uh, – clean up the balance sheet – Get some more cash in the business so that you can, um, you know, invest in, you know, maybe it's investing in more development. That's great. Uh, so if the, if there's more companies like this that have the ability to do it, um, more power to them. And I think that maybe the IRA bill spurs some of this stuff on, right? So there's some there's some tax credits to be had, and there's some some money to some funding to be had from the federal government if you're developing new. Right. What well, does that raise the the value of the asset though? 
Is, is that what Duke is thinking is because the production tax credits are back that the value of those assets just increased? Well, it depends on the age of the assets, right? So if all your assets are 10 years in one day, well, they're not eligible for PTC anyways. And then you'd have to right. repower them. And there's, you know, there's, of course, repowering schemes where you can get back up and running with a higher name pay capacity and and then make some more money off it. But if these assets are, and I don't know exactly what Duke's entire portfolio looks like, but if these assets are in that six, seven, eight year old range, there's still some PTC legs left on them. That makes it for a, you know an interesting uh, business outlook, especially depending on who's looking at it, right? Like off air, we talked right. a little bit about that. So, so what do you think about who might be interested in this thing, Alan? For four billion dollars, is just not a lot of companies that can afford that. Right? Yeah, the, the, I mean, the list starts to shrink. The list gets really short quickly. Right, Next Era probably is in the in play. There's a couple that come to mind. But are they in the mood to invest right now and to, to make that uh, for, you know, you're taking four book billion off of your cap table in a sense yeah, by, big time. by doing that. Right. Yeah. So it's now the time to do that. You'd have to have a lot of runway. Right. So companies at the moment in the United States are looking to protect themselves and have cash because with inflation and everything else mm -hmm. that's happening, you, you, you go to not making a lot of revenue, maybe going negative for a while. You want to make sure the business has enough cash to sustain six months, a year, two years worth of down, mm -hmm. down economy. Clearly Duke's doing that. Orsted's doing that. A, a large, a lot of big organizations are doing the same thing. Who's who has all the war chest to do, to make that transaction today. I, I think that, that's a pretty small number, but Duke thinks they have a, maybe have a, a bidder or a couple of bidders already. I mean, capital is expensive right now too. And it's only oh, yeah. looks, in the, in the near future, it only looks like it's going to get worse. So, you know, <clears throat> big players out there, of course you have your next era, Iberdrola, Iberdrola, Avon yeah. Grid, however you want to slash that up. They've right. got some cash um, or some, some, some stroke. The other thought is maybe there's some oil majors that want to, make some moves or maybe there's some people that want to do it. Well, maybe Elon wants it. I don't know. He just spent 44 billion. I don't, maybe it's an early Christmas gift or something. 4 billion. That's chump change for him. Well, could it be someone like a Facebook? Could it be a Zuckerberg? Could it be an Amazon? Could it be one of the, the, the companies that uses a lot of power, just grabs hold of the assets mm -hmm. says Walmart. How about Walmart? Right. They have that, uh, that, the, the uh, giga, giga PPA, giga PPA <laughs> thing. Yeah. Right. It, it, maybe that's what's happening is that uh, the the companies that consume large quantities of energy take hold of those assets and just manage them. Not going to run them, but that they would just manage them. Do you think there's any any play here for buying part of it and part piecing it off, or is it just like, hey, this is going to be one lump sum? Well, that's what the Walmart. That's what my thought was with Walmart because that's what Walmart's been doing, right? With all those suppliers, right? They buy the the big farm. And then they mm -hmm. parse it out to all their suppliers. I'm not too sure mm -hmm. how, how they work those negotiations. The whole thing's a little weird. But that, yeah, I think if you're Walmart and you want your suppliers to be in the renewable business or using renewable energy, but they can't afford to do it on their own, especially manage it, Walmart or manage it, you just buy into it. So mm -hmm. they're creating a financial instrument. Isn't that what Walmart just did? I guess they created a financial instrument to Basically. invest in renewables. Yeah, there you go. So, yeah. you know, I think that the interesting thing will be here, of course, who buys it? That's always going to be interesting. But second, what does Duke end up doing with the capital that comes out of it? So, you know, of course, they're going to clear some balance sheet stuff, but they're looking at cutting an additional $100 million in cost from operations. And yeah. they previously had set a $200 million cost cutting goal. I mean, just, just getting rid of the, the O&M costs of three gigawatts of renewables is going to save. Right. That's no no problem. I don't, yeah. I don't see why it wouldn't. Um, so well, the, this you know, is where we, we need to talk to Philip Totaro. So the one thing mm -hmm. we're, we're working on right now, and, and we're going to have Philip on the podcast here shortly, hopefully in the next couple of days to talk to some of these issues because his company, Intel store does a lot of research into the different farms across the United States and actually around the world. And I wonder if he has a pretty good insight as to what Duke's assets are quote unquote worth. Uh, you know, what does it look like PPA wise? How old are they? What's the value, rough value of the, 
of the assets? Because I think that's going to be the question mark for everybody that is looking to, it's kicking the tires right now. It's like, yes, yeah. what, what is this thing? <laughs> where are, first of all, where, where is all the assets at? And, and second of all, what are they all worth? And what's the productive life of them, right? Um, mm -hmm. It's like buying a used car. You want to drive it a little while, kick the tires, check the oil, Understood. make sure yeah. everything's running, right? Make sure it shifts gears properly before you buy it. Yeah. Make sure you don't buy it and then have to put a new transmission and tires right. and ball joints and everything in it. Yeah, we don't want to do that. So uh, we'll, we'll follow this one definitely because it's really interesting. It's a huge sale. Um, huge. And, and, yeah. and I mean, it's a direct big impact to the uh, energy security in, in America, right? I want to make sure that, or in my mind, I want to hope that this thing gets sold to a, a, a U.S. operating company rather than someone overseas. Yeah, that thought crossed my mind earlier today, too. Yeah, I, I, I wonder. I, 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 do, I do wonder about that. Like I said, we just have to wait and see how this comes together, but I'm sure there's going to be a lot of eyes on it. Well, Joel and I had a little bit of a dispute about Duke Energy and its renewable business, and I proposed that the production tax credit may make Duke or incentivize Duke to try to offload that renewable business because it just made it more valuable. Joel said he didn't think so. So we brought in an expert. We brought in Philip Tataro from Intel Store. And if you haven't followed Philip on LinkedIn, you're missing out because he is providing great insight into the renewables business, wind in particular. He does solar also, but he's a data analyst. And I thought, well, who would better know than Philip Tataro? So, Philip, welcome to the show. Thank you, Alan. I appreciate you having me. So what is the deal with Duke Energy and then renewable business? Why is Duke trying to sell that business now? What's driving that? Well, Alan, I think you're going to win this debate with Joel. Uh, the production tax credit, and more specifically, the uh, basically semi-permanent extension of the production tax credit through the Inflation Reduction Act, is what has motivated a lot of asset owners that have either an operational portfolio of wind and solar assets, uh, or uh, more particularly project developers that have uh, greenfield uh, project development sites in a, in a rather extensive portfolio to contemplate, um, you know, basically the, the extension of the PTC makes this uh, type of a portfolio much more valuable today. And it's, it's actually led to a more recent deal as well with um, Brookfield Renewable buying Scout Clean Energy from Quinnbrook Infrastructure. Um, that deal was entirely motivated by the passing of the IRA. Uh, so what Duke is doing now, um, about six to nine months ago, they were actually looking at their portfolio, um, trying to evaluate what they want to do with their business. Do they want to stay in renewables? Do they want to start co-investing in offshore projects, um, offshore wind projects in North Carolina, for instance? Um, you know, they, so they've t kind of taken this uh, opportunity with the passing of the IRA to say, now is a good time to divest what we have, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're they're out of renewables altogether. Um, you know, it just means that this particular chunk of their asset portfolio is something they want to consider divesting at this point. Uh, and you know, four billion is an interesting number. We'll see if they get what they're asking for, but you know, it it could end up being more than that, depending on how excited the market goes with this and how hot the M&A market becomes. So their assets are distributed all over the U.S. and South America. Does those assets in South America are not affected by IRA production tax credit at all? No. Um, and the, what's interesting, though, is they, they have, I think it's three wind parks in Bolivia. Um, most of them just got recently built. And they're, uh, they're basically saying, all right, you know, we have this portfolio. I don't know what triggered, to be honest, uh, what triggered their interest in the Bolivian market. Um, there hasn't been anything particularly um, motivational from a policy standpoint uh, like we have with the production tax credit in the U.S. to say we, we have to, you know, go deep in, in uh, wind energy in Bolivia, which is not the biggest market in the world to begin with. 
Um, but it's it's a recently built portfolio that um, would also you know serve somebody well who's active down there. Um, as far as the U.S. goes, they've got a an asset portfolio that's about 3.1 gigawatts of operational wind, uh, onshore wind, and about three, just under 3.3 gigawatts of solar uh, PV. So um, it's you know I, what a little over 6.4 gigawatts for four billion dollars. You know that that sounds like a, a pretty fair price. These are really interesting uh, bits of information in that. I've only seen from Interstore and you, Philip. So this is fantastic. And uh, if you haven't seen Philip's site, go to Interstore uh, on the web, check him out on LinkedIn. Always great stuff on Philip's uh, LinkedIn page. You're going to learn a lot about the industry. So, Philip, thanks for being here. And we'll have you back soon. Thank you again, Alan. I appreciate it. Get the latest on wind industry news, business, and technology sent straight to you every week. Sign up for the Uptime Tech Newsletter at weatherguardwind.com slash news. Well, there's some positive news on the blade front. TPI is going to reopen its blade factory in Newton, Iowa. They they signed a 10-year agreement with GE to manufacture blades there. The project's going to reopen and the facility is going to reopen in 2024. And it's been closed since the end of 2021. So TPI made blades in Iowa from roughly 2008, if I remember right, 2008 to about 2021. And then they just didn't have any more orders. So they they shut her down shut and her mothballed down. it. Yeah, which is a big problem because uh, Newton, Iowa was uh, where Amana appliances were made for a long time. And then that ended up getting closed. And so they, they went from closure of this, uh, they made dishwashers and all kinds of things over there. That closed. And then the blade factories kicked open and that Spread new life into the community. Then that obviously closed when the downturn happened and COVID hit. Uh, but it looks like there's new life, and a ten-year agreement is is a great deal for TPI. It gives you some stability. But there, it's it's funny how it's not open until 2024, Joel. Well, I, from from what I was reading in a couple of different articles and little news clips and stuff, it was it was looking like they're going to have they'll be full steam in 2024. I think okay. in 2023 they'll start to ramp up. Um, and okay. it was basically like in 2024, we will probably have seven to 800 jobs, which is wow. massive for, a, for yeah. a small community, right? So right. it was when, when they closed down, that TPI factory was the biggest employer in that county, I think. Oh, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, probably, yeah. And and so it'll bring it back. And that 10-year agreement, you know, like in in business, when you have a customer – and that customer is like, hey, we want you to invest. We want you to, you know, buy new trucks and ramp up with us. But they don't give you, a, a, you know, a, a, some Cash. visual on how long it's going to be or anything. But when them say, the, right. when GE comes in and says, hey, man, 10 years, let's get this thing up and moving. Well, that that makes a business decision easy, right? Then you're like, 10 years, right. we got some runway. Hell yes, let's get this thing moving. I mean right. – you know, GE's looking forward to, or look, you know, looking at the crystal ball, thinking, you know, the IRA bill, PTC funds are back rolling, and they must have got some some orders in. Um, must I'm have. excited for it. I think it's great. It's you great think it's for re- You think it's repower or new? Oh, I think it's new. Um, okay. Yeah, there, I mean, there is some there is some stuff going on with some GE blades out in the field right now, or they they may need to make some old models again, uh, but with some tweaks to them. But um, for the most part, I think that uh, there's there's just a big push here. I think that it's there's repowerings going on, yes, but there's going to be more new installs. I mean, like I, I talked to a guy last week, 10, 12 jobs, 12 development jobs coming in in the last month, month and a half. Whoa. Uh, this is a early stage civil company, right? So they're like, yeah, it's, it's happening. And you know, that's, a lot of solar in there and stuff as well, but it's sure. renewable energy development. So um, I'm I'm really excited for this. I we talk in the background about man, it seems like all we've had is bad news lately for the for the last little while. <laughs> this these layoffs and those layoffs and this this court case and this that and these guys pulling a PPA and now it's like, hey man, some good news. Great, cool for the people of Iowa. Good for the wind industry in the U.S. Um, yeah. it, it makes me smile to read that stuff. So is it, is the effort then to just reopen the 
the plants that you closed. There's a, there were a number of plants I think so. that got closed, right? And instead of building, yeah. uh, are you think they'll be doing anything offshore wise, or you think it's all no. onshore? Just it's because all of where onshore. It's got to be. Yeah, I okay. mean, there's no, there's no, there's no way to get blades easily. To, I mean, I guess you could get them over to the Mississippi and float them down, but I think well, the locks that, are too short. That's anyways. what I'm wondering. Yeah, that that was one of my questions. Was is this uh, a possibility of getting them <laughs> down the river to, I don't to think Mississippi, so. Louisiana? Right. No. Okay. I, it's I would say. I would say. What else are going to do it? Yeah. Yeah, I mean it's possible, but it's it's it, reopening a mothballed factory. While it may be expensive, it's a lot cheaper than building a brand damn new one. Right, right, right. And so, so, so the molds are still there. I'm sure they kept them, you know, for these existing blades that are still in production or stuff that was not out of production too late, where there'd be repower, like you said. Right. Um, so the molds are there, the factories there, the, and I, and I hope. Maybe maybe a lot of the people in that town left and went and got other jobs, but I hope that they're just going to get some of that talent right back, right? So they're not Oof. completely retraining their whole staff. Um, they've got some people that know what they're doing, um, yeah, so we don't, you know, you can alleviate some quality issues there, hopefully. Um, so it's Local. good for the community. It's yeah. good, yeah. So uh, uh, my blade list in my head right now is LM up in North Dakota, right? That's mm-hmm. essentially it right now in the U.S. And then LM up in Canada uh, for GE. So mm-hmm. those are the two. Everybody else is closed at the moment, I think. Uh, yeah, TPI's got that Siemens, big factory in Mat- Matamora down just across the border from Texas. In, in Mexico, two miles. right. Yeah. 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 And then it's, I don't, I'm sure Siemens is making blades in Colorado still. I think that may still be happening. So there's not – a lot of blade activity. So just opening one facility is like a huge percentage wise improvement in terms of capability and production. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, creation. Yeah. So it's a, it's a, that's a, it's a good move. And I'm, I'm glad that GE at least believes that they're going to need a place for 10 years. Uh, when I first saw this news, there was a little trickle about it. I thought, Oh, they got one project. I think I'm going to flip it open and close it again. But 10 years is a long time. That's really mm-hmm. hopeful. Good. And, and the production tax credits obviously are playing into this. That's that's what the hope was, right? The, the IRA <coughs> bill was the whole point of that was to, to kickstart onshore and offshore wind. And it looks like it's doing it now. Yeah, I would be willing to bet that there's some smart financial people in the in the background at GE that are taking advantage of some of the – I think yeah. there was some 30% when you reinvest this, that, and, and getting some of their – reopening and, and cleaning out the, the factory costs paid for by the IRA bill. So, so you, you think they got a bunch of, of uh, accountants with the green visors on late at night, pencils and <laughs> yeah. pads, <Yeah>. calculating. <laughs> like, hey, hey, if we buy some PPE, is that does that count for reopening? <laughs> yep. Get it, get it on the list. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I hope so. I mean, that's what the funds are there for, right? I would like to see them go to something like this to help out that community in yeah. Iowa. Then... I don't know, get thrown away into some innovation project that never sees the light of day. Yeah, I'm with you. Well, the Interior Department has tapped Texas and Louisiana for offshore wind development. And I think we all agreed that that's where it was going to happen anyway. But they've defined Mm -hmm. two areas. Uh, The first uh, wind energy area is about 24 nautical miles off the coast of Galveston, uh, Texas. And that's about 500,000 acres with the potential uh, to power about 2.1 billion homes. So that's a decent sized area. And the one near Louisiana is is about 50 nautical miles off the coast of Lake Charles, Louisiana. And it's about 170,000 acres and has the potential to power about uh, 750,000 homes. So both those projects are pretty large. Uh, Obviously the winds in that area are lower than they are off the East Coast, but there's ways to get around that. Obviously, just bigger mm-hmm. turbines, bigger blades, whole thing. So the next step is for BOM to uh, start the leasing process. So they got to go through a number of steps before they can put up the proposed sale notice and get the comment periods and all those things going. But the process has started. Now, my question is, uh, and there's been a lot of discussion in uh, sort of global wind energy press about this, is well, since the East Coast is having such a difficult time getting some of the the staging areas set up and some of the mm-hmm. environmental <laughs> concerns mm-hmm. addressed, I still think Texas and Louisiana have a pretty good shot of 
having some yeah. offshore wind up and running pretty fast. Uh, do you think the same thing, Joel? One hundred percent. The only thing there, the only hurdle there is the weather. How are we going to combat these hurricanes? Because I don't know. Maybe, we're, we're talking 56 nautical miles off of Lake Charles. Yeah. Two, the last summer, full summer I spent in Houston was two years ago. They got hit by three hurricanes in one summer in Lake Charles. Because I was in Houston and I'm going, and we we're sitting there watching, watching the news, watching the news, getting all prepared. And then every one of them was like, just went east. And then Lake Charles, wham. And then yeah. another yeah. one comes through and you're like, oh man, I hope this isn't the one. And then just goes east, wham, Lake Charles. And it was, felt so bad for the people over there. Yeah. Um, you know, to the point where people were prepped up and ready in Houston and they started just saying like, screw it, let's put all our generators and stuff on trailers and get them over to Lake Charles. So right. the people over there. Yeah. So, okay. So you have the port facilities exist. Oh, sure. They're already there. They've been servicing oil and gas platforms offshore for 40 years, 50 years. So th yeah. that's there. So everybody knows the ports are there. You have landings to bring a cable ashore. No problem. It's, Texas is open for business. That's what the governor says. <laughs> there. They'll make it happen. <laughs> Isn't, that, um, you do have isn't some... it funny though? Because the the press, yeah. some of the press you read about these these two leases is, oh, Texas has got to catch up in the renewable business, and they're all oil and gas in Texas and Louisiana. Like they got the most, on. they have the they got the most wind in the whole country by a by a long shot in Texas. Yeah, I was probably in the ballpark, right, in terms of just percentage wise. But come on, yeah. Texas has been a I leader think... in renewable energy forever. In the United I States, think 20, I think twenty. The last time I looked, it was like twenty four point three percent of wind towers in the United States were in Texas. Yeah, like that's one state has a quarter of the capacity. I don't know, those, I don't know if those nameplate capacity or towers, but but either way. So, and the other the other one of the other hurdles there is all the geoscience stuff that's been going on in in the, on the East Coast for a long time. We've been talking yeah. about this. Yeah. The geoscience profile is set in stone off the coast of texas everybody yes. knows exactly how it is they know the depth they know the compositions they know like yeah you got to go and do it again but they know what's out there they know what to expect they know what they're getting into everything is boom 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 because they've done it already they've already put jackets in the, in the ground they have all the manufacturing facilities they're, they're yeah. ready to rock True. Uh, the most of the most of the wind turbine blades that come from overseas come into the port of houston anyways so like right. the shipping, the logistics is all set up. Like everything's ready to go. Everything's all set up for them. How how do yeah. they swing and miss on this? Speaking of swing and miss, congratulations to the Houston Astros for winning the World Series. But <laughs> yes, you, right. you know what I'm saying? Right. Houston is a huge area. I think in America, especially on the East Coast, you don't think of Houston as being a really large city. I think it's like the fourth fourth largest city in America. Yeah. It's a huge yep. place. And yeah, there's a, a lot of capability there. And you're right. Oil and gas have been there forever. And shipping I mean, has been engineers. there forever. Right. Yeah. And they have they have the resources engineering. They got technicians. They have steel. They got shipping. They have all the things yeah. they need to go make, make wind turbines happen. You know, one of the things that I've actually been uh, talking with some of my friends in the renewable energy insurance sector is they're talking about Houston being the the Wall Street of renewable energy. Yeah, that's going to be that's that's the next that's the next step. Like they're they're they've got some you know you've seen a lot of the uh, innovation and energy transition efforts going fl sim you know floating in there, and all those good engineers are there. And now you're starting to see like I just read a thing the other day, G Cube Insurance. G Cube is one of the biggest uh, renewable energy insurers in, in, on this side of the world. Right. They're now like, hey, we've been, we've had a presence here. We've probably had a presence here. We're putting people in Houston. Lloyd Warwick is there. Like, there's a there's a ton of big companies down there, um, and it's based on a lot of the big players in insurance. Of course, are marine um, risk insurers. So the Houston being that energy hub, offshore oil and gas for the global global sector. It's Singapore, London, Houston for offshore insurance. And now it's it's becoming that way for renewables as well. So it's just, it's yeah. I mean everything's floating in there. You're gonna see. I'm surprised there isn't more renewable energy companies there. Like there's there's they I mean, will be. There are already yeah. a ton of them in Texas, right? I can mm -hmm. think of several off the top of my head. And, and they Texas will is the leader and will be the leader. Boston is trying to compete for that, but they they just don't have the people, the resources, the technology that that Texas yeah. has. Right, so no. it's it's going to end up in Texas, just like pretty and, much everything else at the at the moment. 
in the business atmosphere. That's what I say. Like make that yeah. joke about Governor Abbott saying Texas is open for business, but it's literally on on billboards when you drive into the state. Texas is open for business. Um, that's why I'm in California right now, right? I'm out here going to actually talk with some insurers uh, about solve their pain problems. And we would California. Everybody's going from here to Texas, so right. That's just <laughs> reality. Yeah, Joel's in California in shirt sleeves, and I'm in Massachusetts in, in long sleeve, <laughs> looking like I'm ready to go chop down some wood. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. winter is coming, everyone. It's it's yeah. almost here. <laughs> right. Yes. So so I mean, if I'm looking at this right, seven hundred fifty thousand plus two point one million, you're looking at the capability of being able to provide power for two and a half to three million homes in that wow. in that Houston, Lake Charles, Galveston, Beaumont, Bay right. City area down there. And I think the population down there is probably right around 15 million. So I was going to say 15. Yeah. I was going to say 15 also. Yeah. So you're going to provide, you're going to provide possibly for just residences. You might cover 50% of the residences or 40, 30% of the residences with this one project or on top of all the other renewables that they have going in that part of Texas. They're getting pushed in there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it all, it's you're starting to see if you follow the transmission lines out to West Texas, because that's where all the wind is, of course, you're now seeing like little bloop, solar farm, bloop, solar farm, solar farm yeah. all along the whole corridor. I know some ranchers in between Houston and San Antonio that all of a sudden, like, hey, what's going on out here? Like, you're the renewable energy guy. I'm, oh, there's hooking into the grid because it's easy. It's simple. That's and these guys it. have. It's it's that interconnect play, right? It's simple. There's no there's not a whole lot of infrastructure and cost to, to get in there. So like right. this one right here, off, offshore Galveston. I mean, the the load one of the biggest load bases in the country is right there. So boom, you're done. Yeah, the whole projects get much simpler, right? I, I mm-hmm. think if you think about East Coast offshore, West Coast offshore, Gulf of Mexico offshore. Probably your lowest barrier to entry is probably Gulf of Mexico, excluding the hurricane yep. bit for a second. Yep. It's probably Gulf of Mexico. But you even had there's a what's the name of the company that just popped up in Louisiana? Not popped up. They've been around for a little while now. Gulf Wind Technology. Don't know. Them. They're 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 uh, one of the premises around the company is to do research into uh, like hurricane proof, typhoon proof wind turbines. Gulf wind technology. I'll take, take a well, look at Well, did that exercise recently uh, on making the blades hurricane proof by making them flexible or bendable. Yeah. Right. So uh, obviously uh, companies are looking at it and Enrol is looking at it too. And you're going to need to do it because like you said, once projects get the go ahead from state legislatures in Louisiana and Texas, it won't be long before those things kick off and just, and are making some noise. So, Good. Yeah, and hey, nobody yeah. wants a nobody wants a beach full of fiberglass. So, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, they don't. Lightning is an act of God, but lightning damage is not. Actually, it's very predictable and very preventable. Strike Tape is a lightning protection system upgrade for wind turbines made by WeatherGuard. It dramatically improves the effectiveness of the factory LPS, so you can stop worrying about lightning damage. Visit weatherguardwind.com to learn more, read a case study, and schedule a call today. So, Jonathan, welcome to the Uptime Wind Energy Podcast. Thank you. It's great to be here, Alan. We have Jonathan Kasuth from uh, Windesco, and Jonathan is the Senior Director of Customer Success. And Windesco is a fellow Massachusetts. <laughs> what are the companies of Massachusetts? Uh, we're another one that makes two of us in Massachusetts that are involved in wind energy. And so it's nice to have another Massachusetts company on the podcast. I think you're the first one from Massachusetts that we've had on the podcast. So congratulations. You're first in line. It's good to be here. <laughs> you guys do some really interesting things at Windesco. And I want to talk about today the find fix measure system you have, uh, because I've heard discussions about it. In a lot of places, it comes up quite a bit. Like, how do we squeeze out the last couple percentage points of AEP? Uh, there's a lot of different talk about how to do that. But Windesco has been a leader in that field for for a number of years. Yeah, so we've been uh, you know developing fine fix measure over the last uh, six years or so. You know, the company is now eight years old. 
Uh, but we've been working, you know, focusing on how do we improve energy for turbines, you know, since 2016. Uh, we started with uh, yaw misalignment was really, you know, how can we identify and fix yaw misalignment? And so we approached it, we approached this from the point of view, no hardware, you know, we don't want to use hardware. We want to be a SCADA only solution. And one of the things that we've really focused on over the years is using high speed SCADA data. So we are looking for high speed data on the order of seconds. You know, if you can get this one second data, that's the best. We find yaw misalignment, we can work up to about 30 seconds. You know, a 30 second sample rate. Wow. Okay. So, so find fix measure is a uh, basically using the existing hardware on the turbine using the SCADA system and just acquiring more of that data. Is that the, the fundamentals of it? Right. So, yeah. So we'll take this high speed SCADA data. We'll do some analytics, some of it machine learning, some of it more straightforward analytics. But we're really looking to identify opportunities where turbines are not operating. Uh, generally, we call it optimally. And I think there's a lot of non-optimal turbines at the moment. If you just drive around, we drove to the Midwest this summer and you could just see, you could see it while driving down the interstate. Uh, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of fine tuning that needs to happen on wind turbines. So how does the system basics, what's the basics construction of the system? You're using existing high speed SCADA data. What are you doing with that data? So uh, we'll analyze, we, you know, ingest it from the customer. Either they might give us, here's a year's worth of data today, or we'll start acquiring data in real time. Uh, we process it in the cloud. So we ha we've we broken this down into what we call fines, right? So we have 60 or so issues or fines that we're looking for now that have been f basically fully automated. You know, we feel comfortable with the algorithm, but we're looking to evaluate things like rated power performance, rotor speed behavior, pitch angle behavior, you know, how are the sensors performing? Is the temperature sensor performing? Is it measuring a good temperature? Is it, you know, slightly off? You know, a couple degrees off can make a difference. How does the anemometer look? Is the nacelle transfer function working okay? Okay, so you're actually pulling down really refined data, things that maybe others are not looking at. You're, you're, you're pulling temperature data. That's, you're really deep inside the turbine, actually, uh, pulling out information that, that you wouldn't think is obvious. I mean, if I, if I was going to pull information from a turbine, I wouldn't think about temperature data. What are you using that information for? What are you doing with that data? Two things. We compare the turbine. You know, is it is its performance changing over time? You know, in each of these different categories. So we break them down. How does the pitch behavior look? How does the rotor behavior look over time? So we compare its performance to itself over time. But we'll also compare these metrics to other turbines to say, you know, how is this turbine performing compared to turbines that are nearby? So you're pulling high-speed SCADA data. You're processing that data. What can you do once it comes off the cloud? What things are you doing back to the turbine? Like, what areas are you focusing on to make improvements to the turbine? So what we would do, so we run these analytics, and then we have a, a portal that the customers could log into, and they would see the results of our finds. So when we find issues that are uh, fixable, you know, hence the fix, you know, we'll uh, flag these issues to the customer. and for some issues, we can just say, go change this parameter and the turbine should be fine. Other issues may take another round, you know, of investigation, a little more focused investigation. You know, if we see, um, you know, if a pitch angle is not correct, there might be two or three reasons that that pitch angle is not correct. So we wouldn't just say, go change this parameter, but it sparks a next level of investigation. You know, are these pitch angles different because you change the blades on that turbine? And, and you didn't tell anybody, you know, or, you know, we, we, we try and get this information ahead of time, but sometimes information slips through the cracks. So we would spark that level of conversation. Do these turbines have different blades, you know, which is one reason you might have a different pitch angle, but, you know, and then eventually we'll say, if they say no, we're like, all right, let's change the parameter, you know, to make it correct. Or maybe we have a conversation with the OEM. Is there a software change that the customer, you know, may not know about that has a different pitch angle. Is there a reason for that? So we don't want to just say this turbine has a different pitch angle. Let's make it look like the others. We really want to understand why that's the case. So we would have, you know, a checklist of a conversation that we would want to do. You know, you think about your check engine light comes on in your car. 
you don't fix the whole car. You bring it to the mechanic to understand why that light came on. So, you know, we want to be a little bit of a check engine light that your performance isn't what we would have expected it to be. Let's figure out what the next level is. Well, that's a good analogy because I think you're talking about even deeper, like before the warning light even comes on, there's a lot of codes that are happening in the car that you don't get to see, but you plug into it. Like I just did recently, you plug in, you're like, Oh, there are some places where the, the engine is not at optimum performance. It hasn't flagged anything yet, but they probably need to be addressed. It sounds like you're down that deep into a turbine. Yeah. And we've actually seen some issues, um, like you said, below that alarm level. We had an example where a turbine was operating at rated power. You know, it's, the wind was strong enough that it was in its rated power region. But we saw the power dropping and coming back up, dropping, coming back up over you know, a period of hours. And it would do this multiple times. So, and this was flagged by our high, one of our high speed uh, power fluctuation tools we look at. We look for high speed, you know, power behavior, do that evaluation. And long discussions with the customer, the OEM, finally tracked it down to a bad nacelle fan in the, up in the nacelle that wasn't operating. So it wasn't cooling the top, the part. So you know, the, the turbine itself said, oh, my temperature's too high. I should reduce the power to cool the turbine. The tur- and that would work perfectly. The turbine would cool, and they would say, oh, my temperature's good enough. Let's go back to rated power. But the OEM alarm logic wasn't logging this. It wasn't happening for a long enough duration to trigger an alarm that the customer would see. You know, that would get elevated to the customer, like I said, with the check engine light. But we were able to see that very easily with our tools get the fan fixed and get them the performance back that they were looking for. Well, you, you don't really consider those uh, odd failures of, and what the effect is on the long-term health of a turbine. Raising and lowering temperature like that is not super healthy on a, on a turbine. Just like pitch alignment is not a great thing. If you're, if you're off, you can do a lot of damage to bearings and long-term it can be very expensive. So you're able to catch those sort of nuanced early failure conditions before they turn into very expensive, costly repairs. Right. And that's sort of a side effect of our approach though, right? We're really after power. So this shows up as a power, it showed up as a power issue, but yes, there's also a lifetime component in that as well. And we also had another issue where we saw the uh, generator speed was fluctuating very rapidly, but around, around the correct uh, speed, You know, but it was just, you know, it should have been 1,500 RPM as an example. It would go between 16 and 1,400, you know, on the order of seconds, but the average was 1,500. So that's something, again, our tool flagged, it it was showing up in the power fluctuations as well. So our tool flagged this as a power fluctuation. But when you look at the 10-minute stats, it looks fantastic because it's happening at such a fast scale. Your 10-minute average would say this turbine is generating it's rated power, but we would say, well, actually you're going plus or minus 10% about your rated power all the time. So in that case, the impact on AEP, which is what we're after, isn't really there. Our tool still flagged it. We raised it to the customers more of a lifetime issue. Like, Hey, you know, your generator can't be, you know, lasting as long with this kind of issue happening. Those are really serious things. And if, if you detect some of these issues early on, what what does Wendesco – you're not changing – Wendesco is not changing the turbine, turbine parameters. You're just telling the customer so they're alerted to it. There's no there's no feedback loop here through Wendesco, right? Wendesco gets all the data and then informs the customer as to next steps. That focuses on our fix. Like So, for example, for yaw misalignment, we know for most turbines how to correct yaw misalignment. So we'll give uh, the customer instructions – You know, oh, you have a Siemens turbine, then you should do this. If you have a GE turbine, you should do that. You know, for different OEMs, we'll give the how they can do that. And a little bit of that depends on their arrangement with the uh, OEM. You know, but we've worked with OEMs to get changes made, even when people have had full service agreements. So we're very proud of that. That's something we've done. We've been able to um, get that done. So in those cases, we would work with the customer and the OEM to increase the power of the farm. I mean, because really ultimately all three parties want the turbines to perform as well as possible and carrying that message through, we've been able to get 
you know, make changes on turbines that, you know, even under full service agreement. So that's something that we're excited about that we've been able to do that. Because Modesco has been around for a while and you've been doing this uh, fine fixed measure piece, do, are you starting to be able to categorize types of turbines and, and or issues that certain turbines have and other ones don't uh, just because you have the, the high speed data to look at it? Yeah. So yeah, we know like if we get a farm, you know, a new project to work on, And it's a certain OEM, I'm not going to name any names in case I slip on something, but, you know, we know what things tend to happen more often with certain OEM models versus others, but we don't gear our analysis to that. You know, we run all of our checks, you know, we run, we have 60 plus checks growing all the time. We'll run all of those checks. And, you know, for some cases we might have to adjust the algorithm a little bit because we know. OEM, you know, turbine model A, this issue manifests itself a little bit differently. So we might have to look for it a little bit differently than in B. So we might say, you know, for turbine A, it has a pitch issue for this, or turbine B has a pitch issue that way. And the way we detect it might be a little bit different because we know we're looking for slightly different behavior in those cases. That's interesting. So you're actually tailoring your algorithms to the specific turbine that you're looking at? In, in a couple of cases, yes. For the most part, our algorithms are OEM agnostic. You know, we've worked really hard to be that way. You know, yaw misalignment is OEM agnostic. The, the, the only thing that does matter is how you implement fixes. You know, that's very targeted towards the OEM. But there are a couple other, yeah, I mean, there are some features that exist on some turbine models, but not others. So we run those checks, even though we know they aren't going to happen, you know, on that on that turbine. So I, I went to your website, and if everybody's watching and listening, I ought to go to Windesco's website and take a look at all the information there. One of the things I noticed it was a little discussion about cut in, cut out, and it it seems so obvious at the time, like, oh yeah, that makes a lot of sense. If the cut in is not right, and the turbine's just trying to start up, start up, and it can't or it won't because of the the way the SCADA system's set up. That that's not healthy. One, it's not healthy, and two, you're not producing any power. What can Wendesco do in those sort of cut in, cut out situations? So we have uh, some cut in, you know, checks and some cut out checks. Um, those are also intertwined with the cell transfer function checks and anemometer checks because those all become intertwined to some extent. You know, things like cut in and cut out. So we also do a cut in uh, evaluation. You know, we've had a couple farms where the turbines weren't the winds were low but they were high enough that they could start and the turbines just wouldn't start the controller wasn't optimized for this type of lower wind site is probably the you know the real solution but we were able to show but this doesn't show up in 10 minute data so if you looked at the 10 minute power curve it wouldn't it wouldn't strike you that there's something odd at the farm but when you look at the high speed data we would see over a course of you know 30 to 40 minutes, the turbine would continually try and start up. The wind would support a startup, but the controller just wasn't optimized in that case. So we were able to work with the customer, make some adjustments uh, to the parameters and get the turbines to start up. And you know, that actually is a lot of energy because this is a lower wind site. I think we got them like one and a half percent AEP just because it's a, instead of not running all those times, they're able to run, right? I mean, that, a little bit added up becomes a lot. That's that's a lot of energy. It is a lot of energy. It's uh, and so the other thing we see with cut in and cut out is for farms that have something like a bat curtailment. You know, we want to make sure. You know, we want to, pr- to protect wildlife. You know, a pre, you know, acknowledge the requirements of the bat curtailment both res- with respect to time and wind speeds. But we also want to make sure the turbine's operating when it can be. So if your nacelle transfer function is off, some turbines may not be operating when they could be. And that's another thing that we'll check by doing, you know, spatio-temporal comparisons. We'll compare across to other turbines and over time to say, you know, looking back and forward in time, are you cutting in at the right wind speeds and cutting out? Um, and compared to other turbines, how are you doing as well? So. Those are another opportunity where you can get energy just by making sure the turbine is operating as efficiently as possible. And, you know, I would say, you know, when you look at the cutout side, you know, same thing, the cell transfer function problem, 
or bad parameter settings. Are your turbines shutting down sooner than they should? You know, and for those that have a soft cutout, does that soft cutout look like it's behaving well? So we'll kind of do these sanity checks to make sure things look good for that. Now that you have all this data and you're digging through it all, what are the, some of the most common issues on turbines? And at least let's just say the United States. What are the common ones? Like anemometers seems like an, a, a, anemometers fail all the time. I mean, I, I've seen piles of them at some operator sites. You go, oh, yeah, simple device. Yeah, but it, it's constantly moving. It'll eventually fail. What kind of failure modes are you seeing sort of consistently consistently through the industry? Worldwide, we have about 5,000 turbines that we've done analysis on. And, um, you know, we talked about just the U.S. I'm not quite sure how it breaks down in terms of the U.S., but you know, about 40% of them or so have had yaw misalignment of a magnitude worth correcting. Okay. That seems high. Yeah, and it, it, it does depend on OEM, right? So, some OEMs are better, you know, on average across everything. That's about what we've seen. We've seen a lot, you know, a lot of issues that we've seen, you know, some cut in issues, rated power behaviors, not necessarily the oscillations that I talked about earlier, but just settings may not be correct, turbines not reaching rated power for one reason or another. You know, sometimes it's just parameter settings. They may have done some work on the turbine, you know, they derated it to do some work and then forgot to, or thought they, you know, we've all done that, right? You're like, I thought I clicked enter, you know, so. <laughs> um, but everyone's so busy. You know, if you're in charge of 3,000 turbines, you've thought you've done that and you've moved on. You may not come back to check that. And you're going to look at that power curve for a while, you know, your 10-minute power curve and say, oh, yeah, I know that was curtailed because we just fixed it. It should be fine now. It's going to take you longer, but we would flag that more in real time and say, hey, wait a minute, that's turbines not operating the same. You know, we've seen pitch uh, pitch settings be different across turbines. Sometimes it's related to blades. Sometimes they've swapped blades back and forgot to change the pitch settings. So that's, that's a little bit of, you know, low-hanging fruit. But, you know, we've done some pitch optimization stuff is something we're starting to get into as well. How do you find the best minimum pitch? So a lot of Things like that, you know, we're seeing a lot of temperature sensitivities in turbines, so we're investigating that now as well. That's sort of a newer area, yeah. Temperature on the high side or the low side or both? Usually high side. You know, warm is always bad for everything, right? Yes, <laughs> it tends to be. Too cold is bad, but t- warm is always bad for everything. Wow, okay, so because the system is so simple to implement, I, I would imagine that, uh, you know, your customers that once they turn the system on realize like, wow, all right, here's an immediate AEP improvement. What kind of AEP improvements are you seeing on average? So I think across our whole fleet for all the farms we've done, I think we're averaging just, so this is averaging, you know, just over 1%, you know, for most, for most farms. Some farms are super well run, you know, people are just concerned. So there's not a lot there. Others, you know, people might be overwhelmed or just need some help or not know where to look for something. So they'll be on the higher side. But I believe our average has been just about over 1% across, you know, we've done about 100 different projects. So, you know, that's a nice, robust number that we have. In a non-interfering way, I mean, you're talking about just taking the existing data. There's no hardware hookups. There's no extra stuff to do. There's no wires to run. You're getting a 1% improvement just by using your algorithms and high-speed data. That's amazing. That's really amazing. And with the portal, you know, for some of these results, if there's an issue, some of the, you know, and there's different timescales for the results, right? Some things we can tell you as quickly as in like five to seven days that this looks like a problem. Other issues might take 10 days, 30 days. You know, our Yamas alignment is three months, you know, to get that down. So, you know, you, you hook up, you start giving us data within a week. We'll start, you know, we'll be running our initial checks. If there's an issue there, we'll highlight it, you know, and as time goes on, we'll run more of these cases as we get a sufficient data because we've learned over the last six years how much data we need for everything. Like our yaws, our yaws in its fourth generation, you know, so we're pretty confident in that algorithm. It's, you know, it's it's compared favorably to LIDAR. 
Oh, really? Yeah. So, you know, we've done some wide, we actually, we have a case study. Uh, you can go to our website and download that case study where we did a, comp- uh, we had a third party do this validation. NG did this validation for us and our results match their LIDAR comparison. So now you can get the results of fixing Yamas alignment without having to lug up and down a LIDAR or even just lug it to different sites if you wanted to do an upward looking one. Wow, that's that's impressive. So the, uh, we talked about we were just in Wind Energy Hamburg, uh, the technology, those companies that have been around for four, five, six years have really grown to the point of now they're you're dangerous, right? You, you you have all the data, you know where you're going, you can really attack problems quickly, and that's where the industry needed to needs to be right now. And it's good to have companies like Windesco out there that have looked at that data and say, okay, here's the things we can fix. Here's where we can make an improvement. Let's get on it. Because the next few years, I think, these little little incremental improvements are going to make a big difference, particularly in the way in the United States we view wind. Because the you know one of the knocks on wind is it's really inefficient, doesn't run all the time. But Windesco is taking some of that unreliability out of the system. And that's great to hear. Right, yeah, and we're hoping, you know, to make the sites, each site, we're hoping to make them more efficient, you know, generate as much power as they can for the location that they're in. You know, it, you can't change your turbine model. You can't change your turbine's location. So how do you get the most out you can for where you are is really what we're after. Do you, Are your customers mostly picking you up and, and, and using your products as the turbines are new or as they've been around for a couple of years and are trying to squeeze out that extra percentage point? Or both. We have actually have a range of that, you know. So we have older turbines where people are trying to squeeze as much out as you know. Commission dates two thousand seven, two thousand eight. But we've had newer ones where people are like, "Hey, this thing's been running for two years. We're not getting the pre-assessment power we thought. Can you guys take a look? You know, we're, we're coming in as a third party in that case to say, can you guys take a look? I'm not satisfied with the answers I'm getting. You know, maybe the maybe there's something else. You know, going on." Can you guys help take a look at that? And and we try and be collaborative. You know, we, we all want to be a team, the OEM, the customer, and Windesco to get more power. So we try and work with everybody, you know, to get that to get that done. Jonathan, it's been great to have you on the podcast. If if someone's trying to reach you or Windesco, how how do they contact you? Uh, so they can just reach us through the website. I think just windesco.com is probably the best way to reach out to us. I think we have a contact us page there as well. Great. Fantastic. Jonathan, thanks so much for being on the program and we'll stay in touch. All right. Great. Thank you very much, Alan. It's great to be here. That's going to do it for this week's Uptime Wind Energy podcast. Thanks for listening. Please take a moment and give us a five-star rating on your podcast platform. And be sure to subscribe in the show notes below to Uptime Tech News, our weekly newsletter, as well as Rosemary's YouTube channel, Engineering with Rosie. And we'll see you here next week on the Uptime Wind Energy podcast.